Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this session. So uh, we are going to have a very, a lot of presentation in this session. So I would like to ask all the presenters to keep these 15 minutes of time slot. Otherwise we will just go out from <laughs> uh, the planning time. So we are going to start with Konstantin Zachastiev, dark matter, dark energy and multi-scale gravity as manifestation of superfluid vacuum. Please, you could share your screen. We see your video, your camera, and you could start the presentation. I will inform you five minutes before the end of the talk. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, can you see uh, my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay, now I can... Oh, yeah, yeah. Now the problem, I cannot see my presentation because it's covered by this uh, uh, meeting, go to meeting screen. I think we saw your, uh, I mean, now we are seeing your uh, slides. I don't know if it's your slides, yes? Yeah, but I, I cannot see them because you know, this go to meeting closes them. Gregory, it's, can you please help us? Just blocked. No, it's a problem of this. Uh, Okay. How to send this go to meet into the back? Because it uh, it blocks my slides. I cannot see my slide. Uh, Gregorio Gabriele, can you please help us with this technical thing? Now I I I, I see your desktop. Yeah. Oh, now I see this PDF. Okay, uh, the problem is... Um, okay, I will try to adjust. Okay, can you see my uh, desktop now? Uh, my we presentation. Your presentation, dark matter, dark okay. energy, with this first slide. So okay. I, will, I will start now and um, yeah. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, you all know about uh, how many dark matter models we, we have. So basically, it's really difficult to find a model of gravity which doesn't explain uh, dark matter. But it's interesting, it's my personal point of view that um, if you want to have a properly um, reliable dark matter model, it, it must explain not only dark matter, but also something else, at least as much as many phenomena as possible. So here is, um, there is a theory which is called superfluid vacuum theory. It's actually, but actually it's, a, it's more like a paradigm when you see the uh, background of physical vacuum as some kind of superfluid. And within the superfluid uh, vacuum theory, there's a, a lot of approaches. So one of them I'm going to talk now. And, but let me start first because most of crowd here is a uh, is uh, uh, not familiar much with condensed matter physics. So I want to start with some prologue, which means that what what is Bose-Einstein condensate and superfluids, as we know them in the laboratory. Okay, quantum Bose liquid is by definition is consists of particles that obey Bose statistics, and so one example is Bose-Einstein condensate when you have same species particle which are indistinguishable. Uh, according to quantum mechanics, and they have this particle wave duality. So once you um, drop the temperature in your system for such uh, particles, eventually they will fall into the same state and form this what is called Bose-Einstein condensate. And I'd like to stress out that this is an extended continuous object, and it's not just a bunch of original particles because its own it has its own very very own uh, wave function. So in a sense, it's a it's it's like a separate uh, it's a separate entity. Okay, another example of super uh, of quantum fluid is a superfluid. 
Uh, superfluid is a quantum Bose liquid in which dissipative quantum fluctuations are suppressed somehow. Uh, if you have no dissipations, then you have, of course, no friction or drag force. And macroscopically, the superfluid would behave like uh, perfect or ideal fluid. But again, I'd like to emphasize that superfluid is not exactly the perfect fluid. It's mostly like you can view perfect fluid as some kind of classical analog of superfluid. Uh, example laboratory, for example, liquid helium becomes liquid below four kelvins and below, but below two kelvins, it becomes uh, superfluid. Uh, it's actually all called helium uh, two phase, which characterized by zero viscosity, high thermal conductivity, etc. So according to Landau two fluid approach, helium two is a mixture of superfluid and ordinary liquid components. And uh, we know very well uh, the two fluid approach. And we know how ordinary liquid components behaves. But uh, the nature of a description of a superfluid component of the superfluid of helium-2 is actually a bit of a puzzle. So it's still, uh, there is a plenty of approaches addressing it, which is with a different degree of success. So uh, yeah, so the question is how describe the superfluid component, how describe ground state of such superfluid, how describe excitations, and what which quantum wave equation is the best starting point. And uh, um, it turns out that uh, logarithmic linearity occurs in the leading order approximation of a theory of quantum fluids based on uh, statistical mechanics. And you can apply that uh, equation and uh, associated formalism with uh, superfluid component of helium-2, and you'll get quite very good achievement uh, uh, accuracy. And uh, further, you can check your excitations and you reproduce famous landau raton spectrum and structure factor, speed of sound. You have a, you have deviation from experimental data about 3% or less, which is quite ex ex uh, impressive, considering that you have about three, three feet in parameters, but only but two of them are basically scale parameters. So basically, you have only one feet in parameter in the theory. Okay, uh, there are references here. I'm not going to uh, go into further details because I want to jump directly to the <clears throat> uh, superfluid vacuum theory. So uh, let's forget for the moment that we know anything about logarithmic nonlinearity or logarithmic Schrodinger equations. So let's, uh, uh, we know that physical vacuum uh, is a non trivial quantum object, and uh, people who do it will, <coughs> will scale with such terms like. Uh, zero point fluctuation, virtual particles, etc. And uh, the, the current uh, perturbative relativistic theory of physical vacuum is operational because it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a lot of uh, divergence in set, uh, when you try to compute integrals and stuff. So you need to apply additional regularization and normalization procedures. And uh, so question number one, can we describe what vacuum as superfluid embedded in three-dimensional Euclidean space? And a question two, if yes, then is this a comeback of the old idea of ether, which was abandoned uh, long ago? Okay, answer to the first question is yes, we can. And answer to the second question, no, uh, classical ether doesn't come back. Uh, a bit of history. Uh, uh, Dar, uh, Dar, it was, I think it was Dirk in 1951 who noticed that if uh, non removable background matter is a quantum object, then its velocity would be proportional to the uh, gradient of base, phase of wave function. Uh, from quantum mechanics, we know that phase itself is unobservable, therefore no preferred direction in, in space because this velocity will be, would be unobservable too. Analogy is there is analogy with the hydrogen atom as a uh, wave function as a, in the ground state because uh, a hydrogen atom Hamiltonian is, is not rotation invariant, but its wave function is the in a ground state is rotation bar. Okay, on top of this quantum uh, properties, uh, there is an additional property. So if this background of physical vacuum, shall we call it, must be superfluid because uh, so for superfluid, the super fluctuations are suppressed and it would flow uh, without friction or drag. And as a result, any Michelson um, model experiments would be insensitive to, uh, to such, uh, to such uh, material if we are sort of living inside it. Okay, so here we come uh, to two problems. Uh, first problems, we know that non-superfluid models are essentially non-relativistic. But how to incorporate relativity or Lorentz symmetry into this picture? And second, uh, properties so, uh, of this, this superfluid vacuum itself. Why logarithmic? 
Okay, so about relativity. Uh, we know that uh, from uh, uh, various monographs, monographs by these people, uh, there exists a fluid gravity correspondence, which means essentially that um, propagation of small uh, perturbation side three dimensional non relativistic fluid uh, without friction, described by uh, uh, density, pressure, and three, uh, three velocity of vector is analogous to propagation of uh, test particles along geodesics of a four-dimensional pseudo-Riemannian manifold, whose metric would be having this form. Here's the your density, speed of sound, uh, for you. So, um, so obviously, it is very tempting to apply this analogy to the vacuum itself. Uh, for example, so instead of phonons, we are talk let's talk about photons. Instead of sound, we'll talk about light. And uh, the question arises of how to determine uh, density, speed of sound in, uh, in our case for the physical vacuum. Okay, so let's uh, borrow some equation from the quantum boson lipids and condensates, where here your it looks a like Schrodinger like equation where your uh, time part, uh, kinetic uh, energy, the trapping potential, and this is. Uh, some nonlinear function of psi square, which is, uh, describes many body interaction. Of course, this must be uh, uh, <clears throat> supplemented with uh, normalized conditions. Okay, so now let's uh, use the Madeleine Kansatz, which has this form uh, where rho and s is phase. Phase is related uh, through the uh, velocity of your liquid. And then after substituting this guy into this equation, you can get you can arrive to the following equations. First is basically your equation of state. This is pressure, and this is going to be some function of, of density after you after you take this integral. And then your speed of your speed of oscillation you compute as a derivative of according to this formula. Okay, uh, but at this stage it, let's keep f arbitrary. So we want to determine it. Okay, then we substitute it back into that uh, expression for the induced metric. It, it takes this form. Now, uh, question is why logarithm? Okay, now we have to involve correspondence principle because we know that in the low moment of an only limit, uh, our speed of oscillations of our vacuum should tend to the some constant, which is basically is gonna be our speed of light, or historically called speed of light in vacuum. And then, Let's consider this equation as actually as a differential equation. So the left hand side here and the right hand side would be just a constant. And we just solve it as a differential equation. And as a result, you obtained uh, <clears throat> uh, very surprisingly, it's the same logarithmic nonlinearity. So your f, and you, when you substitute back this f, you will get you will uh, you will uh, basically you come back to the logarithmic Schrodinger equation. So basically, logarithmic uh, superfluid is a fluid which is in a, in low energy limit or low momentum limit. It requires uh, a Lorentz symmetric theory or pseudo Riemann theory with a constant uh, speed of light. Again, in the leading order of Planck constant. Okay, so in according to super therefore in uh, superfluid uh, uh, vacuum theory, for the uh, space time is an induced phenomenon. And it's uh, and therefore we must distinguish two types of observers. First of all, a relativistic observer. It, it actually is a guy who operates with small. Sorry, vacuum. you have a five okay. minutes left. You have five okay. minutes. I, all right. Um, okay. Then we, let I'll just let me skip all that uh, thing. Um, so I let me take about observer. So we have two type of observer. Relativistic operates with small, and uh, it, so it sees for dimensional space time. And full observer, of course, uh, sees a quantum superfluid flowing in Euclidean space. But uh, since you have for relativistic observer, he sees the matter, uh, which is defined by right hand side of a Schrodinger of uh, sorry of Einstein equations. So according to observer, you derive psi, then you derive matrix, then you derive uh, all the uh, Riemann tensors, and you, then you get your induced uh, Tensor. Okay, and uh, I, as an example, what you can see the laminar flow of such a fluid, and then you get uh, that actually it will be relativistic observable would see it as uh, some scalar tensor gravity. So in phononic limit, our SVT is general relativity plus dilaton plus logarithmic scalar, etc. 
All right, so limitation, I'm gonna skip it. Uh, okay, now uh, about multi-scale gravity. Uh, let's go back to our uh, working model with uh, uh, sharing equations. What we can, we can divide here, this part of this, we can view it for a given state. Uh, if you're working with a certain state, then it's gonna be, this one become a function of rate. So you can assign an effective uh, uh, induced potential. So from that you can, and define your induced gravitational potential through this effective potential as basically this part. And therefore, in the so this would be an F observer picture. In our observer picture, your induced potential will be part of the metric. This is the metric of the form. So you can always jump between F and R observer pictures. And uh, I'm gonna skip about this entropy. And of, now uh, question is we don't know how the uh, wave functional vacuum looks like. So, but we can always use a trial function, which has a standard uh, form uh, for quantum mechanics, plus it has a Gaussian form, which comes from the theory of logarithmic Schrodinger equations. So let's uh, assume this trial wave function with certain parameter A1, A2, A0, which must be fixed by uh, phenomenological at this stage. And then we substitute everything to that effective potential. And it turns out that our induced potential is a sum of seven terms. And this is where our um, phenomenology comes in because our induced gravitational potential has a, this multi-scale structure. These six terms, but some of them are marked, if they're green, then actually what we know already. For example, potential, uh, uh, Fn potential is already what we know, it's inverse. Uh, Hello, I think we lost you. Sorry, Constantine. Can anyone hear him? I cannot. Yes, apparently we lost the presenter. Generate accelerated expansion of your system, which we know, which is usually attributed to dark energy. And uh, another interesting one potential is uh, this one logarithmic. And you can check it's actually, uh, if it works at galactic scale, that it produces what's called flag rotation curves. Because for if you compute the rotation velocity for this potential, you get a constant. So in a sense, this term acts as the dark matter. Okay, this is what is already we know, but this is something which is predicted. First of all, uh, strong gravity region. So this potential, it's, uh, it's unknown before. It's actually logarithm, so it's stronger than one over R definitely. And it works, and works on, on short scale. Okay, so it's in some sense it makes a hierarchy problem a bit obsolete because we don't, uh, at short scale, we see that gravity is not that weak anymore. Another for astrophysicists, interesting, there is another term which is uh, it's a linear. So it means that actually, your, if it's term is uh, solid on the galactic scale or extra galactic scale, then actually your flat rotation curves are still asymptotically become non flat. So probably somewhere in, a, in the outer regions of very large spiral ga galaxies or something, this uh, rotation curves must become, must follow this uh, potential. And this is gauge term, which is a little bit, okay, it's some, uh, something to think about because there are certain uh, things about it. Okay, so basically that's the whole phenomenology can be in this picture. And uh, let me just uh, jump into the conclu conclusion. So, so that superfluid vacuum theory is de facto a physical vacuum. It's based on quantum mechanics. And it's not alternative, but it's post-relativistic theory. It includes uh, relativity in, uh, in its low momentum uh, limit. So it does satisfy the correspondence principle. And according to SVT, Lorentz symmetry is approximate. Current space and time are induced quantum mechanical phenomena. It predicts that gravity becomes stronger at smaller lengths and it ex explains the effects uh, which were usually attributed to dark matter, dark energy. And it, it makes certain new predictions. And thank you very much. Thank you for this nice presentation. Uh, so if there is any question, please type on the chat so I can read for the presenter. Is there any question? 
I don't see any. So thank you again for this nice presentation. Now we move to the next presenter, which is Vitaly Balian. Could the presence of dark matter affect the neutrino flux? Can you please start to share your screen and put your camera on? Uh, you are muted. We cannot hear you, please. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Uh, and uh, can you see me? Yes, yes, we can see both the presentation and you. And you will see now uh, my presentation, okay? Okay. <clears throat> so can I start? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. You start now. I, I inform you when you have five minutes left. Okay. Uh, so now I want to... Okay. Uh, good afternoon for everybody. I would like to present uh, a short report on the interaction of cosmic rays with dark matter, uh, considering in the framework of the Hippel color standard model extension. Uh, here are uh, some main points of the content of my report. And uh, we uh, work in the standard model hypercolor extension, which structure includes several two or three doublets of additional fermions, so-called H-coarps, which interact with gauge bosons uh, as vector currents. The bound states of such quarks, hypermesons or hyperhadrons, uh, arise within the framework of the sigma model. It's an analog of low energy hadronic physics. The symmetry breaking provides uh, appearance uh, of a set of pseudo number hold stone states, the presence of some additional so called accident symmetries leads to the stability of uh, two, two neutral states in this scenario. It is the hyper uh, pi meson and the hyper baryon due to conserving H baryon number and so called G parity. Uh, these are some. Uh, known uh, properties of uh, H-color scenarios. Uh, here are some uh, additional details of the model. In particular, we can consider the scenario with two or three doublets or hyperquarks. And the Higgs boson uh, in these scenarios is almost standard. It uh, can mix with a scalar partner, the so-called sigma meson. Uh, yeah. And uh, this mixing should be small uh, for the Peskin-Takeuchi parameters to be within the required experimentally known limits. Mm -hmm. uh, in the minimal version of this model with uh, two H-quark doublets, there is a neutral hyperpion the lightest component of the hyperpine triplet. And also we have here the lowest state uh, among hyperbarians and neutral B0. We do not consider here this scenario with three doublets of hyperquarks. It is uh, much complex. Uh, and uh, uh, in the SU4 uh, scenario, there are no uh, some uh, well-known uh, states. Uh, which we can interpret as uh, dark matter. Uh, I think that uh, this table of the lightest pseudoscalar states in the model can be left out of the comments. Uh, we can consider it in more detail another time when uh, I will have a, a lot of time. It can only be noted that both neutral states are associated with different hyperquark currents. Uh, you will see that pi mesons connect with this type of hyperquark currents and B mesons with the uh, current. Uh, okay, uh, two possible components. Uh, of a hidden mass stable states uh, originated from different H-quark currents. 
uh, and uh, they uh, have uh, uh, very different uh, properties uh, uh, relating to the interaction with vector bosons. Uh, uh, particularly, neutral H pion interact with vector bosons, so uh, they have a good uh, link to the ordinary matter, but neutral B states uh, do not interact. Uh, and uh, I remind that both of these uh, states are interpre interpreted as, as uh, two components of the dark matter. Uh, mass splitting in the H pion triplet uh, is uh, small, is about uh, 160 G uh, MeV, uh, um, and uh, mass splitting between two neutral dark matter components uh, is here, and uh, it can be zero or uh, a few GeV, maybe. Uh, here are the widths of uh, two main modes of decay for charged hyperpions. Decay with the production of standard charged pion. The second uh, dominates, uh, and uh, the width is uh, much larger than the width uh, in this channel. So now we have considered the uh, scattering of electrons from cosmic rays or neutrinos by uh, dark matter components. For the reaction on the hyperpion, the total cross-section from incident particle energy in the range uh, up to 10 TeV is from one to 40 picobarns. Uh, and, uh, uh, this calculation was, uh, I mean, this uh, diagram, this calculation uh, was carried out in the quasi-elastic approximation when the target dark matter particle with a mass of about one TeV is practically in rest, uh, and the momentum transfer is small. Uh, it is important now that uh, the B baryon component of dark matter doesn't participate directly in electroweak interactions and scattering by this component in the leading order uh, is described by so-called trident diagrams of uh, this type. Uh, I want to add that uh, interactions through uh, H quark and or H pi loops are <coughs> exactly zero in this scenario. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, term, trident diagrams, was proposed <coughs> recently by Zhu and Beacom. Uh, they uh, use uh, such type of diagrams of contributions to describe interactions of uh, electrons uh, or neutrino with nucleons, uh, but uh, we uh, consider here uh, these uh, types of diagrams to describe interactions with the dark matter particles. Uh, there is uh, the pro uh, there is a process uh, of a kind of um, neutrino multiplication in uh, some uh, resonance re reaction with the production of two neutrinos. Uh, and uh, this process uh, seems to be very interesting. Uh, this cross-section uh, was calculated also, and in the TV region, uh, it is about uh, 40, uh, maybe 50 uh, picobarns. Uh, uh, scattering of high-energy protons by dark matter particles is uh, maybe more important, uh, we have estimated uh, the cross-section for such a processes at various proton energies. As you can see in such a process, uh, a dark matter particle can be noticeably uh, accelerated and the decay of a charged hyperpion introduces again secondary neutrinos, muonic and electronic, into the composition of secondary particles. Uh, cross-section is up to uh, 100 picobarn 
and uh, here uh, we can see some corresponding curves for this cross section. Uh, these are cross sections for the scatter of the protons with energies of uh, 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 50, 100, and 200 of TeV by hyperpions from the dark matter with the production of secondary neutrinos and uh, what is important, uh, the acceleration of dark matter particles. In this case, um, approximately uh, 10 uh, and up to 25% of the energy of uh, an incident proton can be transferred to a heavy dark matter particle. And the cross section is estimated from 10 to 100 picobarms. Such reactions can be important uh, in analyzing the interaction of high energy particles from jets, which uh, are uh, generated uh, by active uh, galaxy nuclei. Uh, and uh, these jets can interact with the dark matter halo surrounding active galactic nuclei, where the density of dark matter is uh, large and uh, sufficiently uh, larger than uh, in the uh, other, uh, other regions of uh, hello. Now. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now we come to a summary and discussions. And uh, we can see that, we can uh, see and uh, we will know uh, uh, that hadrons, leptons and uh, photons uh, with very high energies uh, cannot reach uh, the Earth. And uh, the uh, answer why, uh, it is well known, uh, uh, they interact with gamma uh, background and loss of the energy. Uh, so uh, photons as uh, messengers uh, of uh, interactions near uh, AGN uh, may be uh, aren't very good interactions with uh, photons. The ground uh, of various wavelengths can decrease photon energy, but neutrinos conserve their energy on the way from these remote sources, uh, sources uh, at cosmological distances. Uh, and neutrinos uh, are created in reactions of cosmic ray scattering by decays of mesons, of secondary mesons, of course, neutrinos can be produced in other scenarios where the supermassive X particles uh, can decay or from Z boson resonant transition to neutrinos. Uh, uh, it is a process which uh, was uh, considered uh, in our model or from W uh, boson resonant transition to lepton plus plus neutrino pair or hadronic pairs. Uh, Cross-section, uh, uh, of course, is small for neutrinos. However, they can produce extended air showers with higher portion of neutrino energy. Uh, these uh, showers uh, generated by neutrinos are strongly inclined and uh, they are produced deeply in atmosphere due to large depth uh, where uh, this shower uh, is started. Uh, and uh, there are uh, known details uh, which can uh, to separate uh, uh, the showers from uh, showers uh, generated by protons. And the uh, scattering of uh, ultra high energy neutrino of the dark matter uh, leads to softening of neutrino energy spectra. Uh, some uh, insignificant uh, increasing of neutrino flux, but uh, uh, it can lead also to accelerating of the dark matter particles. Uh, in the process of high energy neutrino scattering of the dark matter, uh, we can see TeV ordinary hadrons, and uh, as a result, maybe mm, some uh, showers. Uh, can uh, be produced, which uh, taken this composition, uh, fast neutral dark matter particle. Cross section for high energy neutrino annihilation with uh, relic neutrino is known. It is 
nearly 10 nanobars for the neutrino scattering of the dark matter. Uh, the cross-section is uh, lower, but uh, for scattered initial neutrino, uh, near uh, 20 TeV. Uh, cosmic rays proton scattering of the dark matter results in neutrino flux increasing with energies uh, from 10 to 100 TeV. Uh, it is uh, 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 nearly obvious uh, uh, some um, uh, words about to, that uh, comp to component structures the dark matter uh, can be seen from some quantitative and qualitative results in vector and scalar scattering channels uh, as we as it is, it is as it has been shown. Uh, these two channels uh, result uh, in some very different contributions to the total cross-section. Uh, because the cosmic ray electron spectrum uh, sharply decreases uh, at high energy, the fraction of cosmic electrons is small in total cosmic ray amount. Uh, but uh, I want to remind that near AGN, uh, the uh, flux of electrons with high energy is much larger. Uh, cosmic ray proton scattering in electroweak or in the scalar channel can give rise also in positrons emerging from secondary pi plus decays. Increases of secondary particles flux and the number of events can follow from the scattering of the dark matter clumps or from centers of galaxies. Uh, so we need in more careful analysis of the space distribution uh, of neutrino fluxes. Uh, this distribution may say some uh, information uh, about uh, distribution of dark matter. Uh, so we need to uh, know also some specific uh, uh, characteristics for showers uh, which are produced uh, by neutrino protons and maybe heavy accelerated dark matter particles. Thank you for attention and I want to thank the organizers uh, of this important meeting for the possibility to discuss interesting and important scientific questions and for the conserving our science as a part of culture and civilization, especially in the difficult historical moment. Thank you. Okay, thanks to you for this beautiful presentation. Uh, if there is any question, please type on the chat so I can read the presenter. Well, up to now, I don't see any questions. So once more, thank you very much for, oh, there is a question. So what dark matter candidate becomes most likely in your searches? Andrew, uh, Andrew Beckwith. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I see, I see. Um, I think that uh, in this model, we uh, consider, we should consider a, in the same uh, foot and the equal foot uh, both of components, uh, but due to electroweak channels of annihilation, uh, a H pion components will be burn out more quickly than uh, B0 uh, H baron component. So uh, in our uh, analysis of kinetics of burning out uh, the dark matter, uh, it was shown that uh, practically all variants um, uh, leads to the uh, uh, some uh, conclusions that H pion consists mostly uh, twenty five percent of the total amount of dark matter, and the other uh, composition is the B zero mesons uh, or B zero H baryons, uh, which have uh, practically the same mass, near one TeV. Okay, thank you very much. So now we move to the next speaker, which is uh, Suvondip Mukherjee. 
so can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear I... you. Can you share your screen? Yep. I just a minute. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do it. So I will inform you when you have five minutes. Okay. Okay. Just yeah. I just want to share. Can you see my screen now also, right? Uh, we see, yes. Oh, okay. We see the full okay. screen now. Very good. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this very important meeting and giving me an opportunity to speak here today. So I'm Shubhadev Mukherjee. I'm from University of Amsterdam. Uh, and today I'll be talking about discovering axion like particles using cosmic microwave background as a probe. So going forward, so what are axion-like particles? They are sometimes they're hypothetical particles predicted from string theory or from particle physics. And they are usually very interesting to cosmologists because uh, they are a possible dark matter candidate. And uh, one of the ways to measure axion uh, is by seeing its interaction with photons in the presence of magnetic field. And this avenue is uh, being really uh, uh, studied or thoroughly uh, uh, used by particle phase experiments, cosmologists, uh, to search for axion-like particles. So what happens in the particle physics sector is, uh, what about that? So in the particle physics searches, like experiments such as CAST, like CERN Axion Solar Telescope, uh, does it is theoretically predicted that at the, in the presence of the magnetic field of in sun, photons will get converted into axion, and that those axions while traveling to Earth can be reconverted by applying a strong magnetic field. That's what is done in the in the sun experiment with the like, about nine Tesla magnetic field, and they expect to see some light by conversion of photon to axion. And they, this way puts a bound on the coupling between photon and axion, as shown by the plot here in the uh, right bottom. In the red line is the current bound, which is about a uh, few times 10 to minus 11 GeV inverse over the mass range, uh, lower than uh, 10 to minus 2 electron volt. What we can do now with the same avenue is reverse the question and ask, can we use this as a, in the cosmological setup? Can we convert the cosmological background light uh, into axion in the presence of cosmological magnetic field? So the process is very simple as shown over here by this schematic diagram is that you have a photon coming, it gets converted into axion and in the presence of a magnetic field such which is given to you from by the nature, such as in the in our Milky Way, in the void, in galaxy clusters. So how the process looks like, as you can see in the uh, simple diagram below, that uh, our universe, as you all know, is, is in the bath of a radiation photon field of about 2.75 to Kelvin, which pretty much looks like a black body. What's interesting is that uh, when these photons are propagating in presence of magnetic field, Though most of the photons are unpolarized, only a few percent of, of them are polarized, when they are passing through the magnetic field, if the axions exist, and depending upon how much is the coupling strain between photons and axions, you expect to convert the photon, which is parallel to the magnetic field, shown by this schematic diagram, into axion. And the one which is perpendicular, the polarization state, which is perpendicular to the magnetic field does not get converted. And that's the signature you are looking after. So the signature you are looking after is a polarized spectral distortion because you are now stealing photons from black body. So you're going to distort black body. So uh, in, a per, in a polarized way, because the one direction of magnetic field which is parallel to the polarization direction gets converted, and you have a new signal which you can measure. So let's see how we can use this. And but nature has provided us magnetic field in several systems. As I already mentioned, we can we have magnetic field in Milky Way, we have magnetic field in galaxy clusters, we have magnetic field in voids. And today, 
for this talk only, I'm going to talk about galaxy cluster and how they're going to be promising to search for axion-like particles by this way. Other avenues are very interesting and I encourage you to write to me or see the papers which I have mentioned. So let's now see what they are going to do from galaxy clusters to detect axion. So you can think that galaxy clusters are like axion detectors which are available in the sky. So the galaxy is have high electron density, which is, we can model it typically by modified beta electron density model. This is a plot from the SPT research results showing the electron density as a function of redshift for uh, about uh, 0.1 megaparsecond above and above. But you can see here that it's, there is a little bit of fluctuation in the electron density, but most of them are pretty consistent with this modified beta electron density model. Though we need more uh, more uh, accurate modeling in the future to get to the axion like science, that I'll talk soon. The other part, and another important ingredient one needs to convert axion, uh, photon into axion and vice versa, is magnetic field. So let's ask the question, how magnetic field looks in uh, galaxy cluster. This is a plot from a recent paper which is shown from the, again from obtained from data that the magnetic field uh, as a function of the radial uh, radius from its center. As you can show, see, the magnetic field is typically strong near the center, about a few micrograms, about four to five micrograms, and it goes down like a power law typically uh, as you go further and further out. So with these ingredients in hand, we can ask how the photon and ax axion can get converted into each other in the galaxy cluster. The effect which is most important in galaxy cluster is the resonant conversion. So what is resonant conversion? The resonant conversion is, happens when the mass of the axion equals the photon mass in the plasma. So in the photons are propagating, uh, uh, the as a, at a particular uh, uh, re region in the around the galaxy cluster, where its plasma mass is the mass in the plasma, which is driven by the electron density, equals the axion mass at that radius or at that region, the photons get converted into axion. And but this is a very simple way of saying it. What you practically do, you basically solve the differential equation given over here in terms of axion mass, photon mass, and the coupling throughout the three-dimensional electron density and magnetic field of in galaxy clusters. When you solve this, what you find is the, sorry, just a minute. Yeah, when you solve this, what you find is that the spectrum, the way the distortion because of axion is very different from the distortion of we you know uh, from CMB or synchrotron or dust or thermal Sonia Zeldovich. So this means we have a new kind of signal which can be measured with a spectrum different from all other means. And we, if we can use this spectrum, we can detect or search for axion-like particles. The spectrum for the axion-like particles or uh, axion-like particles distortion must be made specific for resonant conversion is shown in red in this plot. This is a plot showing the intensity of distortion as a function of CMB frequencies in gigahertz. We have also plotted the CMB anisotropies, which you see basically the like what Planck or WMAP has measured that the, the spectrum of that, the frequency spectrum of that is shown here in black. We have shown the uh, corresponding foreground contamination such as singleton and thermal dust in, in magenta and blue respectively. And the, the synapse of the signal, the Y distortion is shown in the purple. As you can clearly see, the distortions are very different. So we can now ask like how the signal looks around a galaxy uh, cluster. So this is a simulation of the signal of axion in the presence of foregrounds and instrumentation instrument noise. By realistic foregrounds, I mean that we, we currently the way we know foregrounds from Planck, we have used such foreground models. And so you can, what you are seeing here is a plot of a simulated axion distortion for a cluster around redshift of 0.3 for a coupling strength of 10 to minus 12 GV inverse and axion mass 10 to minus 13 electron volt. 
What you find here is that around the galaxy cluster, which is at the center of the location, you produce an excess distortion, polarized distortion, spectral distortion, having a particular frequency spectrum, which is of the order of few microkelvin, as shown over here, for the, for the strength 10 to minus 12 GV. That means that if in the future, TMB experiments are able to measure the sky, polarized sky with a few, a few nano Kelvin instrument noise, then we have a popping signal, a huge strong signal from axion can be you measured. Have you have a five minutes. Yeah, sounds good. Can be measured from by using this approach. So let's see how the signal looks in presence of axion and not. So if I just flip here, you can see this is the excess signal we are going to produce. So now let's ask how this uh, signal will be measurable in the upcoming experiments. So uh, from the measuring side, you need a lot of missions are coming in future in the field of SCUS CMB. We are going to have a ground based CMB experiment, Simon's Observatory, which is of higher angular resolution, already funded, going to cover about 40% sky. And then we are going to have about Lightbird, which is now funded and it's a full sky mission, but low angular resolution. So this is not very going to be very good for cluster science. But, and then in time scale of about eight to 10 years from now, we are going to have CMB S4, which is again going to be an extremely high angular resolution CMB experiment, almost full sky, like 70% sky coverage, and can actually measure the distortion signal, which is I've shown in the right over here, and there are frequency bands of CMS Observatory and CMB S4 in green. As you can see, the CMB spectral, CMB future experiments are going to measure the spectrum very well by this band. So let's ask how can we measure this? In future, with these experiments, we are going to measure several thousands of clusters. Like right now, we are having about 5,000 clusters if I add Planck, Apple, and SPD. But in coming five to 10 years, we're going to make this number change by orders of magnitude, which is amazing because that we can, if we have more clusters, then we can use all of them to put a more stronger constraint or discover axion-like particles by this avenue. So this plot here is showing how the coupling strength of photon and axion for a, like a uh, 10 to minus 12 GB inverse, that's what the G12 implies, is going to be measured using Simon's Observatory, shown in blue, and CMBS4, shown in magenta. For the mass range, as you can see over here, is like 10 to minus 12, uh, 10 to minus 12 electron volt, 10 to minus 2 times 10 to minus 14 electron volt. The region which is shared in, in cyan is basically a region which are far from galaxy cluster, and their magnetic field informations are not very accurate, so you have not considered those. And the region shared in gray is basically limited by the angular resolution of the experiment. And if we improve in both the side, our knowledge in magnetic field by uh, radio observation and in going to a high angular resolution CMB experiment, uh, such as CMB HD, then we can actually probe a wider mass range, which is completely different from the way other cosmological probes can measure axion. So this is the kind of a comparison plot where this new way is going to open a new discovery space in the sense of in the field of axon-like particles. We have listed here all the coming experiments in the cosmic microwave background and have compared that with the current bounds available from particle space experiments such as CAS, supernova, coma cluster, and X-ray in black. As you can see that this is for a particular mass range, but this is not specific, saying that, that, that conversion of semi-photon into axon-like particles can produce a new kind of distortion. This new kind of distortion is possible to be measured uh, from around galaxy cluster in the polarization map of CMB. So like you measured Sunai observable signal, SZ effect in, in the temperature field of around galaxy cluster. Axion like signature is going to be, can be seen around polarization map in uh, around those galaxy clusters. So you can search for the such clusters in uh, temperature map and going to and use the polarization map to measure the axon like particles coupling with photon. And as I already mentioned, this is going to be an extremely interesting scope to measure a new parameter space of axon coupling and its mass. So I'll end here. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for this nice presentation. So please, if there is a question, write on the chat. Okay, thank you very much again for this nice presentation. So now we move to the next uh, speaker, who is Masrur uh, Pogilat, the minimal modified gravity fitting Planck data better than Lambda CDM. Uh, can you start to share your screen and put camera on? Uh, do you see something? Yes, we see your screen and we see your camera on also. So please start. I will inform you when you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. So first of all, let me thank the organizer for uh, giving a opportunity to speak in this wonderful meeting. And this work is together with these people uh, in the Yukawa Institute of Theoretical Physics in Japan. And this talk is about a cosmology of minimally modified gravity. And what we find is that it's fitting Planck data better than Lambda CDM. So we know that Lambda CDM is considered to be the best fitting model in the cosmological data set. So despite its success, uh, this theory, this model has in fact some tensions um, in the estimation, for example, the Hubble expansion parameter H0, and this is considered to be a six sigma deviation in the uh, higher redshift and lower redshift data uh, set. And also in the estimation of growth structure S8, it's also called a sigma A tension. Now it is uh, 3.5 sigma. And recently it also it was also reported a new possible tension uh, which can be related to in the estimation of shape of the universe, uh, I call it as omega k tension. So with this, we can consider lambda CDM can be a first approximation to a more accurate theory of cosmology. On the other side, there is some uh, development in modification uh, in the modified theories of gravity, which is known as uh, minimally modified gravity, which means uh, there are only two degrees of freedom propagating uh, in, this, in such models. So recently, a Hamiltonian construction was made, which is dubbed as F of H theories. So it will be interesting to look at the cosmology of such theories. So Lagrangian of this gravity, the F of H theory is given uh, as, uh, as this um, Lagrangian in the first line. And this H0 is H0 is the Hamiltonian constraint. And in this theory, um, we, we have this extra term uh, in the red. And also we have f prime of f of h, so th this become a function of uh, Hamiltonian constraint. And as well as we have this red term, which is uh, coming from gauge fixing, and this gauge fixing is done at the level of uh, Hamiltonian. So now uh, we we rewrite this Lagrangian uh, to make it satisfy that the new field C is equal to the Hamiltonian constraint. So for more of this construction, you can visit this uh, uh, this citation. So having the theory, we can look at the background equations of motion and the Gauss condition for the uh, perturbation, tensor mode perturbation and scalar mode perturbation. So we couple with uh, uh, matter Lagrangian. It's, it's, uh, we consider here Schutzorkin Lagrangian. So this Lagrangian um, explains uh, a perfect fluid. So it's uh, so one can uh, couple with uh, couple this Lagrangian to in the cosmological structure. So we imagine uh, FLRW metric and we get uh, the following um, background equations of motion. First two equations are coming from the matter sector and rest is coming from the uh, gravity Lagrangian. And we have this conservation equation. So having uh, looked at the background equations of motion, we can go to the uh, tensor modes, I, I mean uh, the perturbations. So for the tensor modes, uh, we have the Gauss condition f comma c inverse greater than zero, and f comma c is uh, is the uh, derivative of the function with respect to c. And also we have the uh, propagation uh, of tensor mode uh, f comma c square. And in uh, with the gravitational wave uh, uh, observation, we have a constraint f comma c is one at the accuracy of ten power uh, minus fifteen today. As for scalar modes, we have usual Gauss condition as GR or lambda CDM, but we have a, a modification in the uh, speed of propagation with the extra term, the second term. Notice that F comma C is one is the GR limit. 
f comma c is equal to zero, and then we have correct uh, lambda CDM coming out. So we have background equations of motion. We have perturbation equations of motion. What is left to study the cosmology is to give f explicit function, the free function f of c. So we do it here. We give a concrete example, and we call it as a kink model because this it's, uh, this f comma c has a kink structure. Um, sorry. Uh, so this model has been built so that it is uh, consistent with the constraint uh, ct equal to 1 at the low redshift. Because of this constraint, uh, we, uh, in the late time, we do not have any contribution, but we have uh, contribution at early times. So f comma c is given this uh, form, and if we look at this f comma c 1 plus uh, a1. So this a1 uh, ensures uh, the deviation from um, the GR or lambda CDM. So that's because f comma c is one is uh, exact GR limit. So a simple uh, integration, we, we get the, this expression here. So soft plus I define it as uh, soft plus of x is log of one plus exponential x. So we see this uh, contribution in the early time, and what we uh, see is that. The equation of state of this modification um, behave like a effective radiation in the early times. So that's it. So we have a theory, a background, uh, equations of motion, perturbation equations of motion. And once we have these two things, we, we can uh, implement into a Boltzmann solver to for the estimation of parameters. So we use a cosmic linear anisotropic solving system as our Boltzmann solver, and we Give uh, we we have to run a Monte Carlo simulation uh, analysis to make the parameter estimation against the data set. So here we consider the Planck 2008 high L T T T E E E correlations and low L E E correlation and low L T T correlation and H S T which have the Hubble expansion rate today a single point and J L A joint light curve analysis, um, which has supernova type to, uh, supernova uh, data and also barium acoustic oscillation. So with this, uh, let's go to the result. So if you want to see the background equation, how it is implemented and perturbation equations, uh, there is a backup slide. We can visit it there. So let's go to the results. So first thing uh, we noticed is that this model is giving a better fit than lambda CDM with a chi-square improvement of 16.6. .6. So this uh, table, it compares uh, each of the experiment individual chi-square in lambda CDM and in kink uh, model, the F of H theory. So what we find here is that this has improved. The high LTTTEE -E -E is improved about 12 and also uh, around 20. And also uh, Planck low LEE -E is also improved, TT is improved, and HST is also slightly improved, which means that the, it may be giving a better H0 value than lambda CDM. So overall, this is a remarkable improvement. So now let's look at the parameters. If you look at these parameters, A1, A1, as I said before, A1 is the deviation from lambda CDM since f of f comma c is one, uh, is the exact GR limit. So in the two sigma, we do not have zero value, which means that in this model we don't see uh, lambda CDM. So there is a non-trivial deviation from lambda CDM. So what in the prior of the parameter estimation, we included, uh, we, we, the, the uh, prior of A1, we included Z, the point zero also, so that if the data is preferring G, uh, G, lambda CDM, we should see the uh, point zero here. So next thing uh, is H0, it's a little bit improved, but it's not so much improved as that to solve H0 tension, but it's a little bit improvement. So with these uh, parameters, having the best fit values of parameters, we have to look at what kind of behavior uh, the variables in cosmological variables have in the background sector and perturbation sector. Let's look at that. Let, let me give a few examples. So this is the uh, evolution of uh, omega f. Omega f is the uh, contribution from modification of gravity. This is omega matter and this is omega radiation. And we said that there is a small transition. I don't know whether if it is visible here or not, but uh, it's visible in the other graph. There is a transition here. So this transition happens um, 
at the redshift, intermediate redshift 743. And we can see that when we look at the equation of state, there is also a transition we see. And this is the uh, zoomed version of this uh, uh, equation of state uh, evolution. We see that this transition is smooth, numerically stable. And this transition happens between the redshift 0.1. Now let's look at the behavior of perturbation. Uh, perturbation, um, it's interesting to see this uh, propagation speed of uh, matter and radiation. And we see the similar uh, transition behavior in, at the redshift 743. And we see that the C uh, M square and C R square, C square is a negative value, which is in, in fact a instability era. We call it as instability era, but uh, this is relatively small. You have if you look five at minutes. the, okay. You have five minutes. Okay. So if we look at the CT square, the propagation of tensor modes, uh, we see that it is one, it's close to ZR after 743 uh, uh, redshift. Before that, uh, it is uh, deviating from the unity. And this same thing is seen in the uh, other variables, for example, uh, delta gamma, it's the energy density of uh, photons. We see a, a, a transition behavior here. It's a, this is the whole uh, redshift, and this is the zoomed version of this graph. Here we have a transition. And similar behavior is visible in other parameters like uh, velocity of a photon and the shear of the photon, and also baryon energy density and its um, velocity, and so on. So these are my summary. So King model fits the data better than lambda cdm, improving chi-squared 16.6. And the parameter A1 is different from zero, even at two sigma, suggesting a non-negligible deviation from lambda CDA. And this model alleviates uh, H0 tension slightly with H0 value 16, uh, 69.19. And we see that uh, there is a, a non-trivial uh, dynamics happen in the intermediate redshift, Z equal to 743, and this take place in the interval of redshift 0.1. And scalar, Propagation undergo an era of instabilities. However, this era is relatively uh, short. And for tensor modes, uh, it uh, occurs a velocity of propagation different from unity greater than uh, Z743. Uh, and once the transition is over, it is to be noticed that once the transition is over, all the evolution returns to the symbol one to general relativity, what is in general relativity. So yeah, that's it. Uh, so Further work is needed to address several points which remain to be explored, like uh, existence, composition, and evolution of combat object for this model. So that's it. Thank you. Hello? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I cannot yes. see. Narek, uh, are you online? Okay. Probably he's out. Okay. The, uh, I see uh, the questions for the audience, please. Okay. Yes, sorry, sorry I have technical okay, yes, problems. Yes, please. You can continue. Yes, uh, yeah, sorry. So there is a first question from Daniel Blick. So uh, has it been shown that no more than two degree of freedom are propagating at the nonlinear theory. For instance, we have Dirac Bergman algorithm for Hamiltonian analysis. Does the modification of the Hamiltonian constraints break any symmetric known in GR? Uh, yes, uh, in the paper uh, I have shown uh, maybe in, in this, uh, and also in, in our paper also we show the Hamiltonian analysis for the uh, for this uh, construction of this minimally modified theories of gravity. So at the nonlinear level, we only have two degrees of freedom propagating. So what is modified is the uh, is the is the Poisson bracket between uh, the Hamiltonian constraint. So there is a, a way to do it such that only two degrees of freedom are propagating. Okay, so uh, the next question is uh, Andrew Beck. Quit. You said scalar propagation has an error of instability, but that this error uh, is short. At which redshift values? Ah, it's uh, it's the redshift value of um, seven forty three. So it's the intermediate redshift. Okay. Uh, uh, and the next question from Shusheng. 
what does transition mean physically at z equals 743 uh that's uh that's a difficult question so um, we see that a deviation from uh, lambda cdm so that's all we can say because we don't have any observation at that redshift to concretely say what is the physical things happening but uh, the evidence we have is that we have a best fit uh, uh, the chi square the fitting parameter is improved and uh, we have a deviation from lambda cdm that's it uh means a question of the change it there are again from shusheng yes uh to be more precise uh if you look at uh, this equation you see that cs square is modified because of this uh minimally modification of uh, gravity the kind of modification we have implemented so you see the second term f comma cc by f uh, f comma c square it's a modification of cs square okay thank you very much thanks for the presentation okay. now we move to the next speaker so we have uh machine alja uh, are you connected i don't know if uh, machine is connected gregory do you see him connected yeah, ah you are connected yeah, yeah. okay yeah very good so can you please share, start to share your screen Sure. Yeah, let me open my camera, please. And, and Shushan, can you please mute your microphone? There is a noise. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen perfectly, but we see okay. this go to meeting. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let me start. Thank you very much okay. for this opportunity for me. Uh, let me thank the organizers. Uh, so this is my work. Uh, this work is, has been done with Daniel Grigors and uh, Matthias Kodash and uh, and I am from the University of Science and Technology. The talk is about the constraining of the interaction dark energy model using cosmic chronometer data and Gaussian process. Uh, this is the archive number. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to talk about the model that we have uh, studied and uh, the, the data we have used, which is cosmic chronometers. Uh, and the uh, Gaussian process techniques we have used to, 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 to reconstruct the Hubble function, uh, and then the numeric and uh, the discussion. So first, uh, we start with the with the standard Friedman metric and the Cartesian coordinate systems, and then we have Einstein equations, and then the energy conservation equation, and this is the energy, our energy added is, which is energy conservation equation between dark matter and dark energy, because you are going to consider an interaction between dark matter and dark energy. So these equations are no longer used. So we introduce an interaction between this two dark matter and dark energy. The motivation for this is one of the like big motivation is to solve the coincidence problem. The abundance, uh, why the abundance of dark matter and dark energy are on the same order of magnitude. Because if you let an interaction, then you can describe why is the number is say in the same of magnitude, and uh, because you, you can explain that there is a flow between this uh, this two uh, <coughs> uh, this two energy, and then you consider them as one fluid. So they are not two different things; they are the same thing. But sometimes one will uh, will flow to another, one convert to another. That's why we have a Q instead of being zero. So, sorry, we cannot hear you. Are you still here?
Sorry, are you here? Well, it seems we lost him completely. Let's wait a moment if he reconnects back. I think I see him connected, but I don't see any. Oh, even the slides are not moving, yes? Yes, yes, he apparently disconnected. Maybe there is a connection issue, so let's wait a minute or so. If we don't have him back, we just proceed to the next speaker. Okay. Gregory, you let me know when to move to the next speaker. We don't see him coming back, so I think it's better. But I still see it. You, you could yes. switch off his screen? No. Okay, let's proceed with the next one. And I don't see either Ilya Obukov here present. Ilya Obukov is present, Ilya Obukov. Seems no. So the next is Orchidea Maria Lechian, specific aspect of evolution of antimatter global cluster domains. Orchidea, are you still here? You are muted, Orchidea. Orchidea, please unmute your mi microphone. Orchidea, we are still not able to hear you. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes, yes, we can now. So the microphone is unmuted. Okay, so uh, you are able to share your screen or there is a still problem? Can you send the, 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 the notification to share the screen? No, uh, we don't have them. There is a buttons, four buttons below. Microphone, this camera, one? Screen. Yes. So now I have, but it, it, it is not clicking. Gregory, the, did you make Arcadia presenter, Gregory? Yes, she is a presenter and uh, maybe- we The can... share is not, uh, I can uh, choose uh, uh, possibly this one. No, we don't see any can, changes. Can so you see? You... Yes. If yes. I go, yes. Now yes. I go full screen, which is Control L. I think so. Yes, we see the screen. Okay. I don't see my screen. What? Because uh, it it is uh, it, it it looks slow. I see my screen now, and uh, uh, so part we see part of the screen now. C can you see my screen? Part of it. Well, okay, what does it better, mean, part? It's better you remain with the partial screen. Okay, this is okay. No, this is okay. Yes, yes. This is better. Uh, I don't have uh, the options for moving the with the, clip, uh, with the clipboard. These arrows on the clipboard. Please try with that ones. I don't have. Uh, uh, just a moment. 
I don't, don't see the arrows on the clipboard. I don't have arrows on the clip. Ah, ah, okay, I have. And can you see also my uh, mouse? Yes. Pad yes. For indications, yes. yes. So yes, uh, it looks ready. Thank you for your help. Okay, now you start. I will inform you when you have five minutes, okay? Okay, so th okay. thank you. Go on, yes, I, I can go on. And uh, um, I, I will be um, uh, concentrating on some uh, aspects of uh, the evolution of antimatter anti globular clusters domains uh, during the evolution history of the universe. And uh, in a particular uh, uh, kinds of biosynthesis uh, scenarios, there is uh, the possibility to create uh, for the creation of uh, regions of uh, antimatter. And uh, such region, regions uh, evolve in time uh, if they have a uh, minimal mass. And it's possible to evaluate uh, their size. And, and which means their density according to the number of uh, antibarions uh, constituting the domain. <clears throat> and uh, it's possible to implement the, the to compare uh, different uh, statistical uh, distributions for uh, these calculations at the end to cal calcul calculate the, 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 then the correlation uh, uh, it is possible to implement the calculation for the correlation uh, functions uh, of uh, uh, these domains according to their density as uh, a function of uh, their value as a function of uh, general relativity. And um, uh, the, the, the time evolution is uh, described by the statistical probability that the antimatter domains are created, uh, and, uh, there, uh, there, and that there is uh, enough, uh, uh, the antimatter domain is large enough not to be uh, an annihilated during the evolution of the universe. And uh, the uh, correlation function is calculated in general relativity by considering the standard cosmological principle that is uh, and by considering uh, uh, homogeneity, homogeneity at uh, very large scales. And so I, I will discuss, I will describe uh, some uh, symmetry breaking scenarios and the uh, nature of antimatter domains uh, and uh, the uh, possibilities to evaluate uh, for uh, different valuations of uh, uh, the uh, number of antibarions that is the volume or density of such domains according to different uh, statistical distributions and the uh, means to uh, compare the results and as an outlook, uh, how to uh, evaluate, uh, how to implement the calculation for uh, the correlation functions, for the correlation function for the uh, antimatter domains. So the symmetry breaking scenario is uh, a, a Lagrangian uh, based on S1 times uh, S2 times U1 and uh, with the uh, CP violation. And uh, it's possible to implement uh, 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 different kinds of coupling and different time kinds of uh, um, efficient variables. So uh, a CP invariant Lagrangian can be chosen and uh, a CP violation can be introduced by uh, uh, con, uh, con, um, uh, decomposing uh, uh, the one of the inflationary one of the inflationary fields according to other parameters so the, uh, the characteristic features of the antimatter domains uh, are that, uh, that there is a minimal mass for which the antimatter domain can evolve without being annihilated which is that their mass should be uh, 
uh, around the two to three solar masses and then uh, that uh, the uh, uh, for uh, uh, for a given uh, initial conditions uh, about the temperature for the temperature about the evolution of the universe at time considered and uh, the correlation functions uh, uh, should be written uh, but, um, at, uh, at present times by considering the complete evolution of the uh, domains during the evolution of the universe. And uh, if uh, uh, the initial mass of the antimatter domains uh, is of this, uh, uh, at least of this value, the antimatter domain can, uh, will not be, uh, is, uh, is not uh, supposed to be annihilated during the, uh, its evolution. So the calculation of the numbers of domains can be done according to uh, statistical distributions and, uh, the, uh, and uh, as a function of the uh, number of EFOs that the universe has undergone dur during uh, its, uh, its evolution and uh, uh, Accord and uh, can be evaluated at any time I indicated as uh, the iota uh, du during the evolution or uh, up to present times. And it can be done uh, by uh, a Gaussian choosing a Gaussian, Gaussian distribution for uh, the presence of uh, antivariance for which uh, um, the time dependence uh, is uh, found or uh, for uh, a modified uh, Gaussian distribution for which a different time dependence is found, or by using uh, um, discrete uh, uh, statistical distribution like uh, Poisson distribution, or uh, for which a typical uh, time dependence is found as a solution in general relativity, uh, where uh, when I mention solutions in general relativity, I refer both to time and to volume. And then uh, the same calculation can be achieved uh, in uh, according to the binomial distribution where uh, uh, a different uh, uh, time dependence is found for the, uh, according to the total number of uh, for the total number of antivariants uh, uh, constituting the antimatter domain. And then uh, there are other kind of uh, statistical distributions, such as uh, non-central Fisher's hypergeometric distribution, which is numbered by uh, uh, which is uh, calculated by considering uh, the number, the probability of uh, 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 a, a, baryon, a baryon to be uh, uh, neighboring with other antibaryons uh, and. Uh, um, which also gives the possibility to evaluate to uh, evaluate what happens at the boundary of the antimatter domain, and another kind of uh, and the result uh, is uh, time dependent, and uh, it depends it, 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 in in an F, in an FRW scenario it depends on uh, the, the scale uh, both on the scale factor and on uh, effective variable uh, parameter at a, a given time and which is also a function of the volume uh, we, and uh, this is important for the evaluation of uh, correlation functions uh, the uh, upper parameter uh, can, can be considered uh, as uh, an effective quantity rather than uh, its evolution because uh, the, uh, uh, the value which, we, which is characterized in the antimatter domain is one achieved uh, in a particular stage of the evolution of the universe with, uh, uh, and for which uh, uh, the baryon density is uh, uh, has a, a specific um, depend, uh, functional dependence on the FRW scale factor, and uh, 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 differently, there's other uh, there are other kinds of statistical distributions can be considered, such as uh, uh, 
uh, Wallenius uh, hypergeometric distribution for which uh, uh, an, a, a, a different uh, um, value is found uh, while uh, the time depend the dependence on uh, the other GR uh, quantities uh, remains uh, unchanged. And uh, it, it, the difference is based on uh, the number of, on the probability for uh, uh, and, and, and for uh, the density, which is uh, also uh, the probability for uh, the uh, number of uh, neighboring antivariants. And uh, 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 more generally, uh, a generalized non-central hypergeometric yeah, distribution can be considered, yes, for which uh, uh, several quantities uh, have to be estimated according to the numbers of variants, the number of antivariants present, and uh, uh, the number of such domain is found again, and which has uh, a, a different numerical coefficient, but uh, uh, has uh, the same features uh, about uh, the uh, dependence on uh, GR quantities. And uh, in, the, in the most extreme uh, hypothesis, uh, uh, matter-antimatter symmetric universe can be considered for which uh, the number of uh, bar the number of uh, um, Antibarions in the antimatter domain has a characteristic uh, GR uh, time functional dependence. And the comparison can be done by uh, comparing the error on the variance and by uh, making uh, particular operations on uh, the errors on the errors on uh, uh, the variance for which it's possible to um, uh, consider also uh, the phenomena happening at the boundary surfaces of the domain, which uh, where the boundary where we, where uh, the antimatter domains are hypothesized as uh, low density antimatter domains, and the boundary sur surfaces uh, are uh, can uh, interact uh, either not with the void, the plasma, or uh, intergalactic medium. And uh, the produ production of hypernuclei is also possible. Then uh, the correlation function for uh, antimatter domain can be uh, estimated by uh, correlation dimensions, uh, by uh, the uh, calculation evaluation of the correlation dimension with respect to uh, the size of uh, uh, of uh, uh, the antimatter domains. And uh, two point, a two-point correlation function can be uh, evaluated for uh, uh, in uh, different cases, uh, but uh, it has to be uh, uh, compared uh, with uh, a binomial uh, uh, with the uh, numerical simulation of the uh, binomial distribution for uh, the number of uh, antibaryons constituting the antimatter domains. And uh, in particular, uh, these are the, the references, and uh, in particular, it's also uh, uh, possible to compare the results for the uh, expression of the correlation functions uh, in, uh, um, with a particular kinds of uh, um, uh, constitution of the uh, of the uh, low density antimatter domains. Am I on time? Uh, yes, thank you very much. It's uh, you need perfect timing. <laughs> so uh, there is a question from Andrew Beckwith. So, thank you. Uh, what do you thank mean you. by the term symmetric matter antimatter universe? Yes, that uh, there is uh, the number of uh, baryons and uh, the number the number of uh, antibaryons uh, is exactly the same. Uh, it's exactly the same. While uh, in uh, more general theories, the excess uh, the number of uh, antibaryons that this the excess of antibaryons is uh, uh, much lower than uh, the number of baryons because. Uh, uh, 
most uh, physical theories are based on the hypothesis of uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, the presence of only baryons in uh, the universe. Okay, thank you very much, Okia. Uh, if there is no other questions, we move to the next speaker. Thank you. How do, do I get uh, the, the the meeting again? Sorry, sorry. How do I go to the meeting uh, uh, no, again? Maybe we can. Don't okay, I can did ask. Yes, uh, don't worry, Arkide. Now, uh, probably we can uh, resume uh, the talk of uh, Moxin Al Jaff, uh, if that is okay. Uh, yes, if he is back. So, so I can see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Arkide. Yes, so is uh, Al Jaff back? Yes, sorry, I didn't know where I lost to the connection. I was continuing my talk, but I realized that uh, yeah, I am disconnected. Sorry for okay, that. Okay, but uh, you need to remind me how how long we went from your talk to just to have the... Or we start from I, the beginning, Gregory. I don't know when I lost. That's why I'm asking. When I lost your connection, I don't know because I was continuing. Okay, please, you can start, but uh, try to be on time. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Just let me let let's make a bit shorter. Yes, not 15 minutes. A little bit less than 15. So this way we'll keep the the timing. Okay. 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 Sure. 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 I will just. Okay. Let me just open my camera. Let me share the screen. Okay, can you hear my, can you hear and see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, so just quickly, I think I, I don't need to repeat some part of the slide, so. Very good. So as I told you that, that we are considering the, 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 the in that interaction, we are going to constrain interacting dark energy models, different form of them, and that's why we we, we introduce an interaction terms uh, in energy conservation equation. We introduce an interaction terms between dark energy and dark matter. So there is a Q. This Q is that quantity that quantifying the amount of the interaction. Uh, I mean the the, the 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 coupling function between dark energy and matter. Dark matter. If you go to the original one, there is this, this the right side is zero because in the standard paradigm, you don't consider an interaction. Uh, but at least in Lambda CD, Lambda CD. Yeah. So uh, our job is to, to introduce an interaction form to this side and then see it and consider some specific form of this interaction and to then constrain the parameter of these, uh, these models and then do a model selection on this model. To, to, to decide which one of them is the most correct and matching the observational data. So uh, we, 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 in this slide, we, in, in, I mean, in this work, we will, uh, we, are, we are modeling dark energy in, and dark matter in one, one single fluid. So, so we will choose modified Chaplin gas. What is modified Chaplin gas? Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a unification for dark energy and dark matter into one equation of state. It means you don't consider they are different forms of different fluids or different energy. They are the same thing, same fluid, but sometimes some of it's a part of dark matter will convert to dark energy. So in total, the same, I mean, same quantity, but the, the, the form of them will, will convert. So there's a flow between dark matter and dark energy. Uh, sometimes from dark energy to dark matter or, or the vice versa. This equation of state has been studied by other scholars in the past. And here you see P equal to A rho rho is the energy density of the fluid. Uh, and B over uh, B is also parameter and rho B is, uh, is, is, is the energy density of that energy. And alpha also the three parameters. So A, B and alpha are three parameters. And if you set this to, to some values, for example, A equal to zero and alpha to one, then you get a simpler version of that, which is called original Chaplin gas. Also, this is another model. And also, if you set A equal to zero, uh, alpha more than zero, so in that case, you'll get generalized Chaplin gas. 
these are related, I mean, this model is, is related to the supersymmetric extension of number uh, that is string theory. Uh, and for check, you can go to those papers. So about the, the specific forms of this interaction, we are having like nine interaction. The interaction are the combination of, 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 uh, of, of the abundance of dark energy and bad matter. For example, in the first one, we, it only depends on the abundance of dark energy. There is all also Hubble parameter, of course, and this small b, which you see in all interaction forms, is a, is a, is a parameter which is uh, uh, estimate or quantifies the strength of the interaction. Uh, or in the second one, it's just, just dark matter, or sometimes it's a combination of the dark energy and dark matter abundance. So in general, the interactions are depending on the abundance of dark energy and dark matter or the combination of them. Uh, there is a principle, it's called Le Chatelet Brown principle, which is coming from the chemistry. And in this principle, it's, it's, it's stating that, that in a reaction or in a system, when it's perturbed and uh, it's deviated from the equilibrium, its own equilibrium state, it means when the equilibrium is broken, then the system will try to achieve a new equilibrium one. So for our universe, when we pass the equilibrium in the beginning, then the universe should try somehow to, to achieve a new one. To do so, he, she needs to, 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 to change dark energy to dark matter in order to slow down the expansion so get an equilibrium state. So this principle is supporting that, 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 that the flow, which we call about between dark energy and dark matter, uh, should be from dark energy to dark matter, not the opposite. So we will check whether our data can, can confirm this or not when we will do our analysis in this in the next few minutes. Also, in this model, because the dark matter, I mean, in this modified chap living gas model, the dark matter is not anymore uh, a pressureless fluid. It's, it has some pressure. This this new, uh, it's, it's, I know it's kind of sounds strange, but it's because of the interaction terms we have introduced in our in our in our model because this is Q that will change the even the, the nature of that energy. So let me directly go to our data. So we use some we, we in the light of cosmic chronometer data, which are direct measurement of the expansion of the universe through the differential light measures methods. Uh, and they don't the good thing about this is that they are not model dependent, they are totally model independent. You don't need to consider any cosmological model like lambda CDM or the other models. You, it's, it's a model independent way to estimate the Hubble parameter under in, in, in a specific ratio. It's not like the supernova or BA, or the different method, which is relying on the differential age of the uh, of the passively evolving galaxies in the sky. So the, the data is already here. It has been, been, it has, it has been estimated by uh, previous works. There is 30 point data points. We employ this data to constrain our model, the Chaplin, modified Chaplin gas models, and uh, constrain the parameters A, B, alpha, and B from the from the, the interaction terms. And then we will perform a model selection for this procedure. <clears throat> so, and what kind of tool we use to our to our method is is, is, is Gaussian process. I am not going to the details because uh, we don't have so much time. But uh, the whole idea without Gaussian process is model independent again. It doesn't rely only in any model. And uh, it's not like, for example, in Monte Carlo, you should consider a cosmological model, then you can start your fitting. But in uh, Gaussian process, they are totally model independent. So we have two good positive points in our, in our uh, technique, I mean, our work. First, we use a model independent data. Second, we use a model independent method to. Uh, to, to, to optimize our parameter. This is the Hubble function when we we reconstruct it from by Gau using Gaussian process and using proper chronometer data. First, we need to to construct the Hubble uh, function and then we use this to to, to solve our uh, Friedman and energy conservation equation in order to check our observables and constraints also our parameters. Cosmological parameters. Of course, we have used the wrong method, the numerical method to solve the, the equation inside the, 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 the 
the, the, the Gaussian process. <laughs> so also we want to perform a model selection for the prediction of Hubble parameter. After we construct the Hubble function, we will also create a, a mock function or a mock data. And then we will subtract this two and then we will get a quantity is called the differential area. This differential area is, is a con or the quantity is, is telling us how the prediction of each model is close to the real one. So the more the smaller you, the delta differential area is, the 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 the, 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 the big I mean the good estimation we have for, for Hubble parameters because you can see the difference between uh, the the Hubble, the mock data and the Hubble function uh, for each model. Uh, as this is the same thing because we want to constrain, uh, I mean, how are parameters? So we constrain A, B, and alpha, which is uh, our three parameters in the equation of state of modified Chaplin gas. And this small B, uh, which is different from the capital, is uh, quantity, as I told you, coming from the interaction terms we have introduced. And uh, it's science can, 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 can quantify the strengths of the interaction between dark energy and dark matter. This is the range we have considered for the, the, when we perform the analysis. For Hubble function, we study in this range, 60 and 75. For A, between minus 2 and 2. For B, same. And for B and alpha, minus 1 to 1. So this is our results. After using the cosmic chronometer data and Hubble function, uh, sorry, and, and, and uh, Gaussian techniques, uh, we constructed the Hubble function. Then we solve our equation, system equation, and we optimize our parameters. Uh, B, alpha, uh, B capital, and A, and it's an estimate for Hubble function, of course, Hubble parameter, differential area, which I talked already about, for each interaction. Thing. As you can see that the B, the sign of B, uh, this is I forgot to say, and the sign of B is positive, it means there's a flow between dark energy, to dark matter. When it's negative, it's the opposite. So this is confirming also the principle I, uh, I told you before. That because the sign is positive, so it means that the, the flow is from dark energy to dark matter in order to achieve the equilibrium from the principle. And uh, uh, the, the differential, uh, we, we also, we see that there is a little bit, uh, I mean, a quite good uh, relaxation in the tension of uh, Hubble parameter for each model. Uh, and uh, one should know that we have fixed the abundance of, 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 of dark matter into 0.315. So that should be key in mind, because if you free this parameter, the results will depend on this and will change. So one of the goals in our talk uh, will be, I mean, in the next works will be, will be, will be to play with this value, not play, but open it and take it over, over a range and see what how it affects on our parameters. So this is just a, a plot of the table I showed you, the differential area, and you see that the, uh, the, 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 the best model So Arlund, you need to conclude? Yeah, I'm concluding, but there okay, are... Okay, very good. Uh, yeah. Because so you, have less, have, you have two minutes, so I forgot to mention okay. you. Okay, okay, good, good. So we also did another check for our observables, like the solution parameter, sound square speed, and the equation state parameter for dark uh, energy and also dark matter. So you see that we have an effective uh, dark matter equation of state parameters because we said that the, 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 the dark matter in this model is not any more pressureless. That's why we have a positive amount for this equation of state parameter, which is uh, coming from the, the, the interaction terms we have introduced. Uh, and uh, also, we did one more test in our, our, our work, which is energy condition test for the models. These are the energy condition, uh, 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 which is no weak and dominant and strong energy. And when we have did it, when we did it for our modified Chaplin gas, we, we, we found out it, it, it doesn't violate none of them. No weak and strong, all confirm it, except for Q3. And as you can see that for other models, if you try with the base, of course, using the base, uh, I mean, the, using these values, the, 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 our base fit value for the parameter, you, for phantom dark energy, the, I mean, the, the interesting that it values all of them. You know, in phantom dark energy, there is a big rectangular 
So we can uh, we can rule out this this form of dark energy, and we can see that our model is not phantom. It's not be our dark energy model in modified charging gas doesn't behave like phantom dark energy, uh, and uh, it can be also it's not a cosmological constant because we replace that with with, with modified charging gas. And uh, what we finally conclude is that, that the, 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 the picture of cosmological constant can be replaced with some, some new evolving uh, field, which is modified chocolate and gas. Uh, and, and, and our data, which was confirmed with, with, with face facing parameters, using the, our observables and, uh, and energy condition, uh, conditions, we confirm that this is a good validated model for dark energy and dark matter. And also, the dark energy will not be uh, a phantom because the, the big rip singularity was rolled out using the base fit uh, values. So, in future work, as I told you, we are going to play with the abundance of dark matter uh, abundance and free it and see how it affects our results. That was all. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm glad to have Okay, thank you for the nice presentation. If there is any question, please type on the chat. Well, apparently there are no questions. So thanks again for the nice presentation. Now we move to the next speaker, who is uh, Kapil Chandra. Gregory, do we have him online? We don't Hi. see Kapil at the moment, and uh, probably he was uh, scheduled on Monday in the program, but uh, he mentioned that he has some difficulties due to COVID quarantine and possibly he will not be uh, even now available. Therefore, we can proceed with the program, please. Okay, so the program that I have, the next speaker is Oleg Zaslavsky, Super Penrose Process, Classification of Scenarios. Oleg, are you connected? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Okay. So what should I do now? Uh, Gregory, can you please help? So that there should be share screen. So there are four buttons. Okay, now I think we see your screen. Oh. Okay. No, uh, I don't see my presentation. Uh, Gregory. Yes, we, a, mo a moment ago, we seen your presentation. Just open it normally on your screen and we will see it. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Uh, but uh, which screen should I use? Can you the, see the, uh, yourself, your presentation? Can you see it now? I open it on my computer. Do you see yes. it now? Yes, we can see ah. it. So you can so I start. Yes. yes, please. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Using well, enhanced quantization to bound the cosmological constant quantum number n for production of 100 relic many black holes and concluding with the proof of minimum time step. All right. There are several parts. A uh, comparison of two action integrals to identify the Lagrangian multiplier set and strength equation on cosmological expansion. A direct Result of the fourth yeah. equation unconventionally compares the action integrals of general relativity to second derived yeah. action yeah. integral uh, clogger. Permits uh, equation five, which is a bound on the cosmological constant and uh, replaces the Handler quantum gravity reference basic integral with the result from John Clouder's enhanced quantization. And uh, there are some other points as well. Please go to the next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Compute the cosmological constant by a technique that John Clyder uh, John Clyder uh, derived. Compute the cosmological constant uh, 
uh, if it is unchanging, it's one of the simplest models of dark energy studies. Uh, suggests up to a billion years ago, the cosmological constant enabled reacceleration of expansion of the universe. Attained the initial formulation of a cosmological a dark energy attain a hundred uh, a relic many black holes, and you have a minimum time step by this construction is related to the uh, formation of the cosmological constant. In other words, I have a non singular beginning of the universe, and I have and I came up with a procedure for a formation of a delta t minimum time step. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. The first equation is the general uh, first integral of general relativity. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The idea is to compare the clouder result, the clouder result in terms of enhanced uh, canonical quantization is S2 to make an equivalence between S2 PQQZ minus HY equaling the first integral um, and, and, and equaling to what a general relativity result. Assumption, assumption, excuse me, I don't know what happened. The cosmological constant is a constant. Therefore, the following approximation from five and six, and this is what is used, this right over here is to use an interior within a bubble of space time. Then I said it's a spatial is a Q naught plus or minus a momentum times a time step at the surface of the bubble. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. What I came up with, and this is verified in terms of three publications, is a bound on the cosmological content. You have the negative value. This negative value right over here is a result of turns that showed up within a so-called potential well type of treatment within a cosmological bound. This right over here is from the general relativity. This is the scale factor. And this has occurred at a delta T value, which is which I will uh, say something about last. Now, why is this lead to uh, gravity and mass of neutrinos? I have mg equals to h bar times the square root of the cosmological constant. Uh, you know, divided by a factor. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next slide, please. Viewing multiverse. Extend uh, Penrose suggests a cyclic universes and an and embedding structure within. The idea is to do not with respect to one universe, but the several or many different universes. The idea is the original Penrose treatment of the Penrose treatment of cyclic. Uh, Conformal cosmology, CCC, had a problem when you were trying to go into the CMBR. As I did an averaging procedure, I was able to avoid this problem. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right. The idea, though, was also was to look at a, a treatment of which is equation nine. The equation nine is a. Uh, is a uh, partition function for the universe and this is the idea of e to the n, n i or iterations for n universes this is a quantum measure term and other things to sort this is the result which is cited in the literature next slide please next slide please the idea was to have an ergodic mixing the idea to have an ergodic mixing which was what you had after the nucleation the left hand side is with regard to the left hand side is with regard to what you might call it nucleation. This right over here has to do with what you might call a number of black holes. This is actually a summary of the Penrose uh, 6 CCC. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. What you had is GAB was equaling to a function right over here. And GAB, and this would be recycled. The idea of the Penrose cyclic conformal cosmology was to do an inversion procedure. Now, what I was trying to do was to come up with a procedure in which then you had uh, uh, H bar, old cosmology cycle, average out each time in a cycle, which you would get to the present cosmology cycle. Next slide, please. No change. All right, now this is just merely a statement of the inputs right over here. Uh, this is also to when I was referring to Hambler. 
And the idea was here is the general relativity S2. This is Hamler's value right over here of lambda. The idea was to try to restate the problem of the cosmological constant in terms of this coefficient lambda right over here. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The result of it was certain manipulations was that this, this right over here, as you'd have G53 right over here, this, this right over here would be proportional to the cosmological constant. All right, so that's a Lagrangian multiplier type of treatment of it. Then you get, when you have a cosmological constant at the surface of a non-singular bubble, you are getting dark energy for free. That's the simplest treatment of it. I was just merely referring to a quantization condition in order to get a bound to the cosmological constant at the beginning of the universe. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, the idea was if you had just passed the uh, cosmological constant, if you had the cosmological constant form and you had a certain period just right afterwards, what would be a way of forming a so-called horizon volume to say that would create what you might call conditions for uh, black holes? And this is a quantum number N. And this is some that uh, uh, Christian Corda and I discussed extensively. I came up with this right over here, an approximation about coming at what you might call early universe entropy, non-zero, uh, right after the beginning of the expansion of the universe. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Using the quarter result with delaying the quantum value in a relic black hole, the quantum state commensurate with penetration between uh, pre planckian and the Planckian physics regimes. In other words, what I'm saying is that formation of black holes after you form a cosmological constant is due to quantum processes and the number n that would be coming up uh, is due to quantum processes which would be relevant toward the formation of the cosmological constant bound why did i have a non-singular presentation uh, to begin with at the start due to the great development of abe abashenkar on day one of this conference of loop quantum gravity, how the tame initial low D, low L deviance from observed CDR data set, the author of this presentation was attempting to do much the same thing by having a non singular start to the universe. Abe beat me to it. Well, I'll try to do the same thing in my own work. But the motivation for having a non singular beginning of the universe was because of the problems with the C and BR with the low L and other things of the sort. And this is something which I've asked people in Rencontres de Morion Cosmology repeatedly, and I didn't like the answers. Next slide. So I'm thanking Abbott. So these are references. Keep on going. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide again. Thank you. Now, which is is that how do you how could you possibly come up? with a minimum time step at the start of expansion universe right outside the bubble now which is is that uh go to next slide please next slide all right the idea was i uh, hear on using Padamadan's treatment of an inflaton uh of an inflaton potential scale in it and t to the lambda and the potential and what i did was that uh go up uh there was it's not showing up in the uh presentation but i'm going to spell it out m times the partial with respect to t of parenthesis was a squared minus a3 equaling to zero this itself was called in a so-called for friedman and or other types of spaces for uh massive gravity a trivial solution which was derived they did a lot of work on it but it was in one sense called uninteresting i applied it the idea when i scaled that which is as i said well you're going to have to get a really big lambda value t one over three a min or something like that or some sort of a minimum scale value which you get as a parameter and one over alpha and one over lambda 
and which was this is not the only way in order to deal with the problem, but this is a way to deal with it. Next slide, please. You have a five minutes. All right. This time sets at the surface of the initial bubble of space time not before is crucial to the formation and understand the future developments of quantum gravity. No time evolution within the bubble of space time for the creation of the cosmological content and conventional step. With the time evolution minimum step occurring at the surface of a non singular star to inflation, clatter procedures for enhanced quantization take place within a singular bubble of space time formation of the cosmological content. With the formation of a minimum time step is related above, it's at the surface of the bubble. And the idea of that uh, uh, M times the partial suspected T of a squared minus A3 came from Tolley, a cosmological comp, uh, application of mass of gravity pays 203 to 224 for modification of Einstein's theory of gravity at large distances by, well, that's what it is, lecture notes in physics 892. Then I, uh, then I went to uh, 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 G. D. Amico, de Ram, uh, de Bukowski, uh, Blah, blah, tease. I cannot pronounce the rest of it very well. Totally PRD. And then I say it is something like this. And this was an article which I published. I'd actually had not one, but three of them. And I've also, too, have been doing more about coming up with the so called gravity. I mean, a link between the Wheeler Day Witt equation and quantum mechanics, which may develop, so to speak, within this small regime of space time. I'm finished. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for this presentation. So please, if there are questions, type in the chat. This is very incomplete what I did. It just as I have about something like about uh, tw uh, 12 times as much in terms of the actual documentation that linked about the balance of the cosmological constant is very, very long. Uh, just is that uh, it would be inappropriate for me that you would go through that in the conference since I'm a 15 minute speaker. So that's what I did. That's my presentation. Thank you for allowing me to, uh, to be a participant in this fantastic conference. I'm an old man and it would made my day. Thank you, sir, very much. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so Gregory, I think we, this is the last of this uh, session. Yes, now we will have a break, yes? You are right, yes. Okay, so once more, thank you very much for all the speakers of this morning, uh, of this afternoon session, sorry. So I, we enjoyed very much this session. So see you after the break. Thank you, Norek, very much. That was uh, very intense, uh, particularly intense session. And uh, yes, we invite everyone to reconnect at uh, four o'clock. Everyone but speakers who should be connecting half an hour in advance. And uh, we'll test the connection with you just to assure that the presentation runs smoothly. Thank you so much. See you in uh, later on for the last session of this meeting. <laughs>